presenting today, I wanted to just take a real quick, brief moment uh, for all of us to thank Robert here for this entire event. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. So thank you very much, Robert. It's worth noting that this is the only Commodore uh, event like this in the entire Pacific Northwest, and it's run by a fellow from California, <laughs> right, who drove for two days to be here. So we really appreciate your efforts in the community for 30 plus years. Thank you, Robert. All right. So who am I? I am a designer. I work on a website called Sporkle.com. It's the largest trivia website on the planet. I work over in Fremont, about two blocks away from the Troll. Um, about three and a half years ago, I started a website called AmigaLove.com. It is a friendly community that, uh, where people, like-minded folks, get together and chat about hardware, software, Amiga-specific, but also, in the last year, we opened up an entire 8-bit section as well because we all started on the Commodore 64, and we all still love it to death, myself included. Um, and then about 13 months ago, I founded the Seattle Commodore Computer Club. Uh, we meet once a month, typically on Wednesday nights, uh, in Fremont at my office. And if any of you guys are interested in that, you're more than welcome to come talk to me about it af after the end of the presentation. I'd love to tell you more. Uh, we have a lot of fun. We eat pizza, we drink some beer, uh, and we play a lot of games. Sometimes we repair machines that are broken. It's, it's just kind of a big Commodore slash, oh, and we also have not just Commodore machines, but we'll have Ataris and Macintoshes and everything. So, but it has a Commodore focus. So that's who I am. And what I'm here today that I want to talk to you guys about is this particular machine right here. This is what I call the Amiga before the Amiga. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute, but it's worth noting for those of us in the audience that might not know what an Amiga is or, or what it's all about, it was launched in the summer of 1985. Um, that's notable because the Macintosh was actually released about a year and a half before that, January of 1984, to much fanfare. They actually hired Ridley Scott, the very famous uh, movie director, to create an epic commercial for it. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but in case you haven't, it shows a bunch of people in chairs Right? They all look a bit like clones of one another, which is intentional. And they're all watching a giant screen. <laughs> is this starting to feel a little weird? Um, and it's got a, a black and white video of just a person's face talking propaganda to them <laughs> that they should just eat it up. That was supposed to represent IBM, Big Brother, right? It was supposed to be the PC world, basically saying this is what the computers are all about. And this, this attractive young female athlete ran through the seats. Don't have one of those today, unfortunately, <laughs> to represent that. But in any case, she throws a hammer into it, destroys the screen, and there is the Macintosh saying, get out of the PC mindset. Here's the future. It was a little, beautiful little box with a black and white screen. It was actually fairly uh, low power, but it was the beginning of something pretty interesting. So now here we are a year and a half later, and where are we? We're ready for the Amiga launch by Commodore. They decided to do theirs in New York City at Lincoln Center, and they decided to bring uh, one of the biggest rule breakers on the planet. This would be Andy Warhol, very innovative artist. He single-handedly created the pop art movement on his own and destroyed a lot of the old thinking of the modern art world with his own uh, foray into uh, the art world. And he had with him on stage his friend, Debbie Harry, from the group Blondie. Now, he decided to start clicking around and actually take in a live photo of Debbie Harry and started to use tools that were actually alpha at the time. And they were actually quite nervous that if he clicked on a particular tool, it was going to crash the whole thing. And he actually did click on that tool, but it didn't crash. And you <laughs> the guy that was standing on stage in a tuxedo was just like, <laughs> okay, and so now we want to move on to the next thing. Uh, it's pretty fantastic. In any case, they decided to, uh, to launch the machine like this to much fanfare. So we're in the middle of the summer in 1985. They asked Andy at the time, 
had he been playing with any other computers, or was this the first time? He said, oh, yeah, I haven't really been uh, working on anything else. I've really been waiting for the Amiga. So news of this machine had already come out even before the launch, right? So people were talking about it. There was no internet, as we all know. There were newspaper articles, magazines, user groups, okay? Um, things like that, bulletin board systems, very rudimentary ways of communicating back in the day. So, when they put this out there, this was something from a consumer level that was jaw dropping. We just talked about the black and white Mac a second ago, which is a respectable machine, black and white screen. This had over 4,000 colors. It was shocking. You could see actual footage on the screen in 1985. This was unheard of. I mean, I mean, a lot of us in here are Commodore 64 folks, so you know how shocking this was when you saw this kind of graphical power of the audio uh, representation of these really amazing custom chipsets that they had created. It had the ability to multitask, where you could be typing in a, a document, flip to another program, do something else over there, and flip between the two without having to close those programs. It was revolutionary from a consumer standpoint at that time. And of course, it had and a really fantastic uh, expandability, especially when it came to RAM. Now back then, back in 1985-86, if you wanted to add on, we were just talking about this a moment ago, if you wanted to add on some RAM, like a meg of RAM, a meg, that would have cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And in today's dollars, just double it. So it was a lot of money. But you, you had the potential to add quite a bit. Now, it just so happens that there was a gentleman in Colorado by the name of Larry Blakesley. Uh, he was in the technology world. He worked for some phone companies down there. He was an Apple guy at the time. He had Apple II machines. He would go to a user group uh, in a nearby city, and it was not a Commodore group or an Atari group or anything. It was basically everybody's welcome, right? And people started to kind of pass this information around about the Amiga. Word had already come out that it was this really insane, really incredible machine, but they weren't going to be available for a while. So it just so happened that he, he heard about, through the grapevine, there was an Amiga at Hewlett Packard. Now, how could that be possible? How could an Amiga be at Hewlett Packard before they were available for retail sale? Because they have Amiga development systems. Commodore created hundreds of these systems and sent them to companies all over the world because it's sort of a chicken and egg problem when you're creating a brand new product. You've got to get it in the hands of talented engineers, software developers, so they can create software and tools so that when you finally launch it to the public, it's not just a box sitting on a table. It actually has things you can do with it. Hewlett Packard was one of those companies that had been identified. Um, they ultimately decided they didn't want to invest in the machine and the platform, um, and so they had these machines sitting on a table. Now, I don't know all the details, and Larry actually, it's been over 30 years, he's retired now, he doesn't remember all the details either. Um, I like to imagine that he went there at night, under the light of moonlight, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, maybe in trench coats, and some money was exchanged, <laughs> definitely some money was exchanged. Um, and then he then cruised away, maybe peeling out the parking lot, something like that. He then was, what I believe, the first person on the planet that we know of to own an Amiga computer who was not a Commodore employee. The first one. And it was Larry Blakesley in Colorado. Now what could he do with it? Not much. There was nothing written for it yet. It was just a machine. It was just a box. But he was teaching himself how to code. Um, it did have the ability for him to go into uh, various parts of the machine to just start to tinker with it and pull it apart, which he did do. And so that's where we have the Amiga development system. This right here, I'm going to talk about how many of these are around the world and, and the various models of them, but what I wanted to do first, hello, come back. Oops. What I wanted to do first, um, it's trying to, there we go. Let's just talk about some of the obvious visual, visual differences between it and the retail market version. That's what this is down here. These are two machines stacked on top of each other. All right. This is 
is actually this is actually Larry's too, or was. Um, it's a really early serial number um, of Amiga. The funny thing is, is that he had this Amiga for about four or five months before they went out onto the retail market. As soon as they were available in the stores, he actually went and got one. So then he had both of these. People are like, "Why did he do that?" I'm like, "I, I don't know. Maybe he had just extra money hanging around, but." He, he actually really wanted the, um, he told me later, he wanted the Commodore support. And when you bought one of these machines, you actually kind of hooked into help if you needed it. You could go in there and say, I'm a, I'm a Commodore a, you know, purchaser, consumer, and they would help you out. So anyway, uh, you'll notice right off the bat, this is the, this is the one that they sold. It has the Amiga logo on it, right? And it has the, the rainbow check mark which is what all the computers back then did, right? They were all trying to show that they had color. They weren't just a black and white screen. They weren't just a green monochrome screen. They had a rainbow of colors. Commodore 64 had colors across the top. Apple did it with the little Apple logo. Everybody tried to show that they had full color, and that was something that Commodore decided to do with this check mark right here. But with the development system, you can see it's the Commodore logo. There's no Amiga branding on it at all, which is really weird. The first time you ever walk up to one of these, if you're used to looking at these, it's like, what the heck is that? You'll also notice, besides the fact that it's really brown, that's from UV sun damage, you'll notice that it's really shiny if you came up to it. Hmm. You can actually see my reflection in it. Huh. So the way it's been explained to me is that when, when you make plastic molds, right, out of the giant... Um, steel molds, when you put the plastic in, one of the last phases of creating those plastic parts, you, you score the plastic and it gives it more of a, a softer feel, it gets rid of that shine. These hadn't been done yet, because it, it still wasn't quite to that stage. And so there's that logo. It's a little hard to see with the, with the lights in here, but there's the logo. So as you start to spin the computer around, when I first looked at it, I was like, okay, so there's really no difference. It looks exactly the same, and I plugged it in, and I have, to my wife's chagrin, I have a few of these, and I've been using <laughs> them for a while, so I, it's just a habit of reaching over to the front, to the, to the side of it, and pulling forward to power it on. It's just a natural muscle memory of mine. And that's when I was like, oh my god, this machine's broken, because it was already in the on position, and it's not on. And I was like, eh. And so then I just flicked it off to see what, what was going on. It's actually the buttons reversed for whatever reason. It's just a really early model of the power supply unit. And later on, they decide to flip the whole thing around. So that's really the only difference on the sides that you can tell. The only other difference that you really see is on the back. I actually made a video about this about a month and a half ago. And I misspoke in the video where I said there's zero difference at all. There actually is a difference kind of see there's little icons across the top that show you where the various port, what the various ports are. When they go to retail, they actually put text labels below all the ports as well. So this is the only, to my knowledge, it's one of the only back panels of an Amiga that don't have the, the label. All right. So on the inside of every single Amiga that's ever been sold, the Amiga 1000, what it looks like on the left. When the Macintosh was released, one of the things that the guys did was they put the entire team that designed it and created it on the inside of those cases. The Amiga team loved that. They thought that was so cool. Even with full understanding that the vast majority of their customer base in the 1980s were never going to pop the top. Most of them weren't. A lot of them were just going to keep them on a table and use them. Regardless, they decided they wanted to do the same thing. So all of the really important names, and a lot of names I've never even heard of, are on the bottom of the, the top tray, including, you can see up there, Mitchy the dog's <laughs> paw print. That was Jay Miner's dog. So Mitchy got in there too. On the, on the underside of this case, there's nothing. They didn't do that. That hadn't been part of the mold yet that they ultimately did. And to that point, this is really crazy. You can tell it's a development system when there are no clips. It just falls oh. off, right? Oh. There's nothing holding it on. I mean, it's pretty stunning because all these other ones, it's actually a bit of a nerve-wracking process to open and close mm -hmm. these things because you know those clips are going to break eventually. Mm -hmm. um, there are no clips to be had here. It just slides on. I'm just going to leave it kind of janky like that for now. All right. Now, if I flip the whole thing.
thing upside down. These didn't have production level serial numbers printed yet. They actually were just printed on regular office paper and some poor person, who knows who it was, had to sit there and cut those all out uh -huh. with scissors. That's not even a straight line. They're like, like, oh my lordy, I'm on 638, <laughs> right? And they just taped it on. Thank goodness that never fell off. Or we would not really not know very much about this machine. That actually tells us a ton, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. And then over on the left, these kind of remind me of those things back in the day when we would go to libraries. Remember those? And people would check things in and out of the library, and they would put the little date stamp on there. It's sort of like that, except this is saying, you'll see up in the corner, it says mod. These are two specific engineer mods that were made to this, and I, don't, I cannot decipher them. It looks like one of the chips might have been changed from a revision two. Um, I don't know what that top line is supposed to signify at all. But anyway, they were keeping track of that uh, so that the folks at HP who were working on these machines, those engineers would understand what, that, what those hieroglyphics mean, basically. And they would at least be able to apply that to whoever they're developing their tools and software, if they needed to, that difference. Now this is probably my favorite part of the whole uh, just visual differences. It's the keyboard. And I brought an original retail version so we can look at these side by side. Right? This is what they usually look like. You got the logo in the corner, you've got little red Amiga A's, the Amiga keys, the text on these keys are kind of bluish, they're all like this. Um, when you get to the development system, and I mean this is really wild, you actually have the Commodore chicken lips down here. No Amiga. There's no logo at all. There's not even a box for a logo chip to go into. It never fell off. There never was one. It's completely tabula rasa. Total blank slate. The plastic itself, it doesn't even match the case. I mean, obviously, because the case looks crazy. But even if the case, if you flip it over and you match it to the parts that have never been damaged by the sun, it's a totally different color. It doesn't match. It doesn't even match the same plastic as the original. And you can see this has no sun damage at all. It's a completely different color. This is more gray. This is more beige. And this is a pretty good quality uh, retail version, right? And then finally, it's a little hard to see for everybody in the room, but the seams are totally different too. This one actually, I actually like the design of the development system better. It's got these cool little corners that they decided to do. On the, on the retail version, they just go all the way around flat, hmm. right? There's the keyboard. And there's a close-up of those. And there's that side-by-side -side comparison I just did. OK, so now you saw on the bottom of this one it had that sticker that said Zorro on it, right? The Zorro is actually the model name of this particular development system. That's what's been determined and at least somewhat agreed upon by the community that cares about this kind of stuff. This is a Zorro, Zorro model. And the Zorro model is actually really close to what the retail version ultimately became. It's really, really close. So what it means is it's one of the last, it was one of the last stages, because this was going through a metamorphosis from the very beginning of the, the very earliest development systems. Those were constantly changing. They were changing everything about it. This one's really, really darn close to the final product. And it has uh, the 256. It can take 256K of RAM in the front expansion, just like a regular Mega 1000 can. And it has 256 uh, on the motherboard, just like the retail version does. That's, that's interesting because, and we're going to look at that in a minute, there are other versions that, that are not quite that capable yet. If you take the tops off of this one, that's what you're looking at here is a photo of this guy on the right and this guy on the left. So the most obvious difference is the power supply, right? It's actually made by the same company, Viking, which is out of California. Um, the, the development system is this kind of crazy uh, black painted uh, metal, and obviously they went to silver. All the retail versions for the rest of time were this uh, silver, silver style, which I actually really like because they actually show you the date of manufacture on them, so you can kind of see how old they are, which is kind of neat when you get in there. 
But otherwise, if you look at the two motherboards, they're really, really similar. Um, the main difference being, in the development system world, a lot of the capacitors and resistors, are they're just different colors. They're just different, a different, whether it came from a different supplier, I don't know. But when they went to the retail mass market version, a lot of the resistor colors and capacitor colors changed. And uh, the, last, the last thing worthy of note is you can kind of see over here these little copper tabs that go around. This guy didn't have any of that. Those are really the only main differences that I could ever figure out. Now, when Larry got this, it was his machine to do with as he wanted, right? It was his personal property. When he got it, uh, he decided to make an upgrade for it in the late 80s. Usually when you turn on one of these machines, it'll ask for a kickstart disk, right? It's saying, hey, I need to know, I just need to know some basic instructions before I get started. And you would put a disk in there. So it, it made some people feel like, hey, this feels like a, feels like a, I don't know, like a child's toy. It doesn't feel right. You should just turn it on and, and start playing. That, that's eventually how Amigas would change. They would make it that way. But in any case, he made it so that you didn't need that disk. He actually bought an upgrade board that has the wrong chip on it. So when you turn this one on, and it does work, it just fires up and asks for the workbench disk instead. So it's not a two-stage process. And I've just decided I'm not going to try and undo what he's done. I feel like that's a part of the history of this machine that deserves to stay intact, even if it's such a rare machine to have been fiddled with in the first place. Now, the one difference between this guy and this guy from uh, a chip standpoint, these are what's called OCS, the original chipset. Um, these numbers, you'll notice the R4, the R3, over there's the R2, that might be related to that sticker that's on the bottom of the machine that we saw earlier. Um, it might be. Uh, these, are, these are earlier versions than what went to retail market. And what's, what's kind of interesting about that, and just worthy of note, the Amiga team, when they built these machines, they, they named all of these chips after people in the office. Most of them were women. So you actually have, down here on the bottom of the computer, you actually had a Paula, you had, a, you had an Agnes, and you had a Denise, right? These ones are such an old, uh, an old state, they actually had different names before that. So we had a Porsche and we had a Daphne which is just kind of funny. They still work the same way from what, from what I can tell. Um, it's just their names did change when they went to retail. Agnes always stayed the same. The only difference about Agnes over time, the poor thing, uh, she, she became bigger, literally, physically in size. And so they started to call her kind of, kind of nasty thing. They seem nasty now. They called her <laughs> Fat Agnes and then eventually Obese Agnes. Uh, but right out of the gate, she was just Agnes. All right, so here's what we think we know um, most likely based on photographs of other development systems that are in the, in the wild around the world. Most likely there were somewhere around 100 of the very earliest ones. The very earliest development system is actually jet black, solid black. Um, and a lot of the ports are in completely different places. Like the, the, the mouse joystick ports are right out front. It looks really strange. The keyboard is actually made of wood. They don't even have pl uh, plastic injection uh, going for the keyboard case at that point. There's one of those known to exist, and there's photographs of them online. Then was uh, the next stage in the metamorphosis, and they called that one codenamed Velvet. They actually stamped Velvet right on the motherboard. It was actually a fairly underpowered Amiga 1000. It could only take half, it only had half the RAM on the motherboard, and it could only take a front expansion of uh, 128 as well. That doubled with the Zora, right? And we think there's, there were probably there were a lot more of those made than any other of these. Probably in the neighborhood, if you can take these serial numbers literally, uh, around 500 of those. And then the one that you see before you today, there were probably only about 100 of these made as well. Mine is up to 638, and that's the highest uh, serial number that's been found. There was a guy in Alabama a couple years ago who also found one of these in a warehouse. He found two. He found a Velvet and a Zorro, and he sent one of his machines off to uh, Vienna, Austria, and that's where it exists to this day in a museum, a computer museum. Because um, 
because it's so rare to find one of these in the flesh, right? So that, my friends, is the Amiga development system. I'd be happy to take any questions on that if you have any. Yeah, sure. In Miami Vice, there was a black Amiga 1000 used in the series. You could see it in the desk on the desk sometimes. Huh. So was that a very early development system? I don't know if it was. I'd have to go look at it. Um, possibly, or they might have just painted the thing. <laughs> um, I would be curious what year that came out. It'd be worth looking at. Um, I don't have I don't have the answer to that, but now I have to go find out. So, yes. So I, I think you said uh, that only six development kits have been found. Um, there could be more. But there's 700, so what do they do with it? Uh, a lot of them went to trash. A lot of them went to dismantle them. Yeah, they were like, oh, this is a useless thing. Okay. Um, a lot of them probably just wound up in landfill. <laughs> um, yeah. Generally, they're not FCC certified, so they can't actually legally be sold either. Uh, so mm. they have to be. So technically, that is probably considered stolen property because it, oh. is, because it, because it belonged to Commodore. So my, my fantasy of how the deal was made might be really close to truth, it, right? There's, there's, there's an element because, because basically, when these things are sent out, they're usually sent out with an addendum somewhere on them that says, this is not commercial hardware, not legal for sale, um, and they have to be recalled and destroyed. I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, there actually is a tiny extra piece of the story I forgot to tell. Uh, when I received the machine, so I, I became pretty good friends with Larry. We had a lot of phone conversations, and we had really long conversations trying to go back through his, his history with these machines. He actually eventually, uh, in 1990, bought an Amiga 3000, which is a really high-powered high machine um, for the time, and created a small video studio and tried to make a go of it that way. And by about 1993, 94, the writing was kind of on the wall for Commodore at that point and how the videography was going to be produced in the future. And he went back to IT, and that's how he finished his career. But on one of the phone conversations, while we were talking about the, the computer that I would received in the mail, uh, he said, so what did you think of the manuals? Uh -huh. And I was like, what? What, what manuals? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? He's like, I sent you two boxes. Oh. You did? Because uh, I, got, I got one box. It's like, well, what's in the box? I said, well, okay, so I got the machine, I got the keyboard, I got a couple floppy disks. He's like, no, no, there's an entirely second box filled with the original manual of that machine. I think it's the only one in existence. I was like, holy smoke, did you insure this thing? I don't even know how you would insure a museum piece like that, but so it became this really like sickening feeling of, oh, FedEx, FedEx, folks. So I had to call them and I said, look, I was supposed to read a, re receive a second box. And they looked at it and they said, it says delivered. I'm like, yeah, you delivered one. There's supposed to be two. They're like, well, it says delivered. I'm like, I don't care what it says on your computer screen. I can tell you I didn't get the second box. So they made me open a case. And they said, just keep calling back every day. They made me do all the work. So every day I'd call. Hello, uh, I was just trying to check on the case. Said, oh, yeah, the manager's been looking through the warehouse. They're going to let you know as soon as, just call back tomorrow. By the third day that I called, they told me, oh no, they, they closed the case, they couldn't find oh. it. Nobody called me. Someone had made, they're not the original manual, but they're copies of the manual. So it says actually 1985, R.J. Michael, the guy who invented uh, the, the user interface in here, right? And he's, he, he did a lot more than that. Um, so I have like copies of the original stuff, but I don't have the real deal, and they were that close. That close to being able to show those to you today as well, well unfortunately. Those are gone to the sands of time and probably being composted. <laughs> but on a more cheery note, <laughs> the second piece of this is all about where we stand today as a community of Commodore fans. And this is all about um, brand new hardware, brand new Commodore 64 hardware that's being created right now on this planet that you can, I'm not here to sell you anything, I'm just here to show you stuff that I've bought um, that's actually really fun. The first one The first one right here is called the C64 reloaded reloaded Mark II. Okay? Every single thing that you see on here with the exception of the keycaps and the chips inside it is completely brand new. So the case, the motherboard, the keyboard, which is really
really special and really rare that I wanted to talk about here in a second. The motherboard itself, this is designed out of uh, Germany. Um, you can get it, it's called uh, Individual Computers. It's uh, designed by a man named uh, Jens Schoenfeld. Basically, you see these black ZIF sockets. They're a little difficult to see, but you take the chips out of a broken, let's say, broken C64. Oh, first of all, let's be honest. How many folks here have ever had a C64 die? They live, you, okay, it does happen. How often is it the motherboard's fault? Almost never. <laughs> it's usually the chips. Usually the chips get fried somehow. The CIA chips get fried, maybe the VIC chip, the video chip, um, something like that. Regardless, conceivably, you could see a situation where you might have two machines, you've got enough chips to assemble one of them into one thing, you can put it in a brand new motherboard, very, very, very cool, you just drop them right in, you don't have to press them into sockets, you just drop them and you, and you flip a little lever, they tighten up on there, it only takes about two minutes to do. The case, the case is very unique as well, and these are getting harder to, well, I'll explain. There was a guy in Dallas, Texas, who found the original molds of the Commodore 64C, which is the cost-reduced version of Commodore 64. Uh, it came out later. He found the original molds and created a Kickstarter campaign and said, is there anybody out there in the Commodore world that would want to you know, try and get brand new cases? Well, tens of thousands of dollars came flowing in. Before you knew it, he had brand new cases made. He had them done in really crazy colors. This kind of really bright uh, beige, blue, red, clear, so you can actually see through it. Um, I happened to find that luckily on eBay about three years ago for 24 bucks. You can't find them for that anymore. They're gonna run you at least $100 realistically these days. However, he sold his molds, they didn't melt them down, he sold them to a company in Germany, and they, I can't imagine the shipping. Mm. They would have been really heavy. And I would have been like, don't lose those two. Um, sent them to Germany, and now there's a company over there that's making them brand new for you as well. In really interesting, like black, kind of a dark brown, some pretty cool Commodore colors. So you can still get them, you just have to get them from over there. And they do have some weird, in my opinion, they have, a, they have some kind of weird imperfections. <laughs> it's like the plastic that they chose. You can kind of see some marbling in them sometimes, or maybe some dimples here and there, but if you're really looking for a brand new something, you can still get it. Now the keyboard itself <laughs> is also made in Europe. A lot of the scene is in Europe, as you can tell, in terms of the hardware that's being created today. Um, underneath here, a typical Commodore 64 keyboard is just kind of a cheap plastic thing, right? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a cost-reduced children's toy, let's be honest. Um, there's a guy over in Europe who was making these by hand, laser cut solid aluminum, right, with uh, brand new uh, Gatorin switches, three different types, yellow, blue, or red. The yellow feel most like the normal C64. They're really soft. Um, the blues and reds are gonna be a lot more clicky, like a mechanical keyboard, so you can get the clackety sound if you really care about that kind of stuff. Some people really do. I went with yellow because it felt more like it was kind of an homage to the past. I hate typing on Commodore 64s. I just honestly do. Uh, I always seem to either miss a key or sometimes they'll misfire and hit twice. It's really hard to just comfortably sit there and type. Not with this one. This is smooth as silk. It is unbelievable. It's the best keyboard in my house. Better than my MacBook Pro. It's awesome. And there you can see where I was starting to insert it into the case with the uh, Mark II below it. All right, so another one of the, this is kind of crazy, but in the back here is this really ugly, let me turn this off and show you guys, one of the ugliest things you could ever imagine. This is called the Turbo Chameleon. It's also made in Germany by individual computers. It is completely ridiculous. They, they could have called this the uh, Turbo Ugly Banana or something, and it would have made a lot more sense. It's actually an emulated Commodore 64. They actually make a little uh, tray for it that you pop in. It has the two joystick ports. If you want even uglier than ugly, <laughs> you can have this thing, um, and it'll look and run most, most simple of C64 games and, and software. 
If you don't want to use it that way, you can use it as a cartridge to expand your C64 with, say, I don't know, 16 gigs worth of games and songs and whatever else you're trying to put on there. And it has an accelerator on it. That's why I actually wanted it. There was a, an accelerator that was sold back in the day by CMD. They're called Super CPUs, and they're about $1,000 on eBay if you're lucky enough to ever find one. This is about a fifth of that. It's also twice as powerful as the Super CPU. So why does that matter? <laughs> well, come on. Because <laughs> it's cool. Um, but more importantly, because you saw on my screen just a second ago, there is this game of Super Mario 64, and some folks were playing it outside, out in the, in the lobby, right? So what makes this interesting, let me go back in here, there, with the acceleration of the Turbo Chameleon, right, you can actually play Mario on the Commodore 64 with not a single slowdown. There are going to be times when you play on a regular C64 when it just starts to chug. If you go into certain levels, you're going to start to see the flames go across. You're going to start to see things get a little slow as it tries to get through that. Turbo Chameleon is going to just chew right through it and spit it out. It's awesome. And on top of that, if you want to keep on going with the, with the crazy insanity of this hobby, there's a guy in Florida who makes My. brand new game pads for the Commodore 64. Now, what makes that interesting is if you didn't have this, the Commodore 64 was designed with a joystick that only had one button. And so if you wanted to play Mario, you actually had to press up every time you wanted to jump, which is really kind of challenging to play that game if you want to play it the way it was originally intended to be played. It was designed to have two buttons, one for running and shooting and one for jumping while you used the direction pad. So he programmed this button over here to go up. So in theory, if you were like walking around on a map, you could press that button and watch your character go up the screen or go up a ladder. You actually can go up the file menu uh, with this button if you wanted to. But when you're playing the Mario 64 game, a uh, Super Mario 64, um, it, feels like a, it feels like a Nintendo. It's a, and I know that sounds crazy. Why wouldn't you just go get a Nintendo? Because <laughs> it's a Commodore 64. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. And the, the NES was far more powerful than the C64. It wasn't even close. But to actually see it and play it right here, it's like, it's like magic the first time it happens, first time you see that. And if somebody wants to play it later, it's out there, it's up here too. Okay, the, the last piece of the presentation today, guys, is uh, what I call the Plexi Laser, Plexi Laser Ultimate 64. Okay, you can kind of see through that. Um, okay, so this is basically a, a couple stories, All right? Inside, is what's called the Ultimate 64. The Ultimate 64, these are designed and created out of uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, okay, by a brilliant genius named Gideon. And essentially what he's done is this is an FPGA board. So there are no chips here anymore. There are no, no more chips. With the exception, you'll see there's two socketed areas back there. If you wanted to use the original most people do. If you wanted to use the original Commodore 64 sound chips, what's called the SIDS, there are two versions of it. You can put them both in there and you can, you can swap between the two, depending on your preference. And sometimes people, audio files care, that's about it. Um, I actually did put them both in there too, because so I was just curious, because sometimes it's kind of fun to do that. Uh, but it's a completely redesigned, rethought out um, idea for the motherboard. It actually has USB ports on it, which is completely bananas. That's actually how I'm feeding in. I have a USB drive in the back because it has inside it this really powerful software called the Ultimate. You can buy them in cartridge form too. And basically, you can pop this cartridge into any bread bin, any Commodore 64, and you can just load you know, hundreds of megabytes worth of data right off the back of it. It has all of that built in. Now, you lose a little bit of the nostalgia factor of using the disk drive and waiting five minutes for your game to load. And don't worry, there's a port back here to plug in your 1541 if you want to. It can run the floppy drives too. It has the exact same ports. If for some weird reason you still want, because let's be honest, if you're playing a role playing game and you have to save those files, doing it to one of these machines is really painful. 
it's actually a lot more, it's a lot easier to do, in my opinion, on the old media, if your old media still works. And a lot of mine still does, so I'll still do that. Yeah. So then we get to the case. Uh -huh. Now, that's what it looks like when you pull it out of the box. These are laser cut. Um, you get to choose the word that goes across the top. Uh -huh. uh, some people will put their names on it. I just went with Commodore. Um, you see all that white stuff? They didn't bother to like blast it with some air or anything. It's still all like shavings and everything. It's completely, well, there's kids in the room. It's hard in the rear, it's a pain in the rear to do that. Because every time you're trying to mess with this stuff, the, there's like static all over the plastic and you'll kind of float around and then stick to the other side. It's one of those things where you're like, okay, you just never, it took me a couple days to actually get it together. Um, in fact, it took me about six weeks because it's really delicate. Oh. You only want to use finger strength on all of the screws when you're putting it together. It's a really delicate thing. It's not something, it's not an SX64, right? <laughs> you're not, not going to go to the pool with this thing. Um, and in fact, when I was tightening one of these brackets, the plastic just went snap. And I was like, oh, okay. So here's the deal. They don't sell them to the United States. Uh, I had to literally beg to have one of these. I told the guy that runs the shop in Germany, um, I said, I'm, why won't you ship them here to the United States? What, what do we have to do? He's like, well, I used to, but I can't, I can't control the Postal Service, and people would keep getting these things, and they're broken. They would complain. They want to have a new top set. It's like it was, I was losing money by shipping to the United States, so I just quit it altogether. I said, now, I'm not saying anyone here should do what I did, but I said, I'm willing to take all, and my wife's sitting right there, like, what did you do? Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, I'm willing to take all responsibility. So if the Postal Service throws it on my porch and, the, and it cracks, I'll eat the cost. I'll eat it. Just ship me one. And so we did it. And I got it. And it works. I did break one of those stands, but he sent me another after I paid for it, which was only about 10 bucks. Um, and he sent me a bunch of extras for free, which was kind of cool. Oh, it has an LED light strip inside it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can pick the color from him when you put it together. You can also remove that one if you feel like it. They actually have inside the Ultimate 64, inside the operating system that they baked in there, um, there's actually an ability to tap directly into an LED light strip, which is like, why, why would someone think to do something like that? Because there's also a built-in SID player on the Ultimate 64. So you can turn this thing into a strobing color disco while you're listening to these ridiculous songs made back in 1984, 85, ridiculous in an awesome way, right? Because um, the, the synthesizer is just so unique and so special. And you can turn it into basically, the whole computer turns into a light show. It's completely crazy. Mine doesn't do that, mine's solid blue. I just keep it that way all the time. But it has the potential to do that in the future. That's it, guys. That is how we take Commodore 64s into the future as our old machines start to fall apart. Any other questions? I want to thank everybody for their time, for sitting in here and listening. I really appreciate it. Robert, thanks again for having this. We owe it all to you. Thank you, Eric.